Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Samuel Adams Returns. Those anti-federalists, they did. They got it absolutely correct. This is Tom Nivolis, your host. Delighted that you're back with me again this week. It's been a very busy week uh, for myself, and uh, it's fortunate that I did have the uh, direction, quite frankly, to get up extra early to do this program and record it. Uh, We're just... uh, extremely busy with our business and uh, many of you may or may not know I'm sure many of you do not know that I do this program um, in addition to being extremely busy with our uh, pepper business and all the things we do with that with our jam so in Ohio if you're ever interested I am going to give you a plug go to Peppers, numeric for fun dot com, peppers for fun, peppers, numeric for fun dot com, and you can see what we're doing. We can only sell in the state of Ohio. Uh, with that, I wanted to bring you to uh, what this program delves into, into the depth of our um, election period, the rhetoric that's going on. As many of you may have seen, Uh, we have locally in Ohio is that a person running for the Senate in Ohio in his uh, rhetoric he fundamentally claimed to kill or look for the killing of the MAGA movement Uh, and you know I read the whole thing so you can look into all that is going on in the media, and I don't care what side it is, who's going to twist somebody's words one way or another. But the fact of the matter is, is that he's actually using that term to kill. And uh, the MAGA movement, when we know that that MAGA movement is probably the closest thing to constitutional patriotism that we have seen Uh, since the inception of the Tea Party movement during the uh, Obama rise to power. Now, in the O'Biden era, once again, we're seeing the attacks on any form of constitutional patriotism. And once again, I have to frankly just say, and the gist of this program is going to be, that our religious liberties are under attack and that we've gotten to this point no different than what it was in the early 1700s and actually taking it back all the way to the Puritan England period of time when we had the wars. We didn't, but England had the wars that ended up with the English Revolution in the 1600s, the rise of Cromwell, the rise of the militant military forces that actually were driven by um, the difference in, in the application of biblical truth. Now, that's what we have going on in so many ways right now. Just another note on that one, just real quick is that the violence by the left, by the Democrats, is definitely coming higher. We have now a Senator Maisie Hirono with doing a call to arms uh, over the potential abortion ban. And then with Tim Ryan making that call, Tim Ryan is a, a congressperson in Ohio who's running for U.S. Senate. And uh, then what we're seeing on top of that is how um, the Biden administration has been militarizing all of the DOJ, FBI, uh, all the different bureaucratic departments to rise up against Christianity, number one. And then number two is uh, that of anybody that <clears throat> has any sense of patriotism in the true sense of the word, not patriotism to a um, socialist, communist de- world view of world, uh, what do you want to call it? I call it globalism, all the isms that are out there. So where does that bring us for today's program? In actuality, where it brings us is to an analysis that I 
am not going to do a frame-by-frame analysis, as I said in the promo. Those that receive the promo, you'll know that. But I highly recommend that those that have not go to SamuelAdamsReturns.net and um, see the program uh, promo or my newsletter. I guess that's a better way to call it, to get the newsletter, sign up for the newsletter there at SamuelAdamsReturns.net. So the only two resources that I'm going to work with for this program is what I was reading earlier in the week. And what I was trying to study and read in preparation for this program, uh, the title of it is there, uh, and the link is there, The Pulpit of the American Revolution or The Sermons of the Period of 1776. Uh, with historical introductions, notes, illustrations by John Wingate Thornton. I was going through and reading that, and it impressed on me once again the importance of the theological basis for uh, mankind in government. And once again, I highly respect all and every one that I know and all the various groups out there that are taking and making every political effort to maintain what should be true constitutional republicanism based on foundational principles. So there's two aspects of that that I really want to emphasize in the, in the program uh, today. One is that the principles aren't necessarily everything that is being touted by a lot of the different groups. And quite frankly, the success of the various groups are not at the level that they could be because they don't have an undergirding of the full weight and context of foundational principles. Tom, you sound like you're talking in circles because you're up at 3 o'clock in the morning working on this program. No, I'm not talking in circles. The fact of the matter is you can look at some of the long-term groups like the uh, John Birch Society that everybody thought were uh, a bunch of tinfoil hatters out there talking about the conspiracies of the communists, you know, since the 60s, when in fact what they were talking about was fact about the communists in America since the 40s, the 30s, and so on, as well as all of the other Tea Party groups or other groups that have been out there and bringing factual information forward, but nobody wanted to listen. I kept wondering, okay, I get it. I see all these different groups out there. They you know, look at Constitution this, Constitution that. They look at the Federalist Papers. But as I have always said, the anti-Federalist writings lay out the predictive course of action. But what's more important, and what we're going to look at is an analysis of a a video, not by a frame-by-frame, as I already mentioned, perspective, is that uh, Pastor Doug Wilson, uh, on his blog, or May blog, uh, it's there, and the link is there, is he did a video that popped up while I was uh, studying the pulpits of the American Revolution, is a primer on Christian nationalism. And it has a longer title, but uh, the fact of it is is that he ends what he says, or actually they take the clip and move it forward, in that if Christian nationalism succeeds, uh, it is in fact... Christian Nationalism 2.0. And when he said that, I, I really it had to go, yes, exactly, exactly what it is, because 
as I always say, the pulpits walked away from Christian nationalism 1.0. 1.0. They walked away from it. They went to allowing all sorts of other uh, theological rhetoric and um, rooftop sitting to take effect instead of taking and continuing in the truth and principles from the pulpit and leading from the pulpit in now what we call the culture wars, when in fact what they're going to be is more than the culture wars. They're actually now a war on Christianity, biblical Christianity, because in essence what's out there, as many know, is that we have, you know, people call it the liberal church. They call it uh, the liberal Christianity. They call it uh, the even in the charismatic movement. Uh, they don't have what I want to circle back, and we're going to talk about mostly in the third segment. They do not have the fundamental principles of catechism. They don't have the fundamental principles of how the uh, true canon is applied. They don't have the principles of confession, such as the Heidelberg or Westminster Confession. They walked away from it. And in this case, I will, not that you know I'm going to be slamming on our Armenian brothers and sisters, but Armenianism definitely led the way to go away from that. Even though you can take and you can go to many Methodists, you can even look uh, at some of those other uh, basic denominations that were uh, initially within the context of that type of theological thinking, and they had some format. But all of the loosey-goosey uh, types of churches that, he, I will say, erupted in the 50s and especially in the 60s and 70s with the Jesus movement and all of that left foundational theological principles which also tied in everything that was foundationally true and established this nation. It's not that we're a Judeo-Christian nation. No, what we were was a nation built on the fundamental principles that we can even look at in the changes that occurred in the Westminster Confession. I would like to take and go through that. There's a, a link here uh, in on the, the Westminster Confession and the, micro, uh, the uh, American version of it in respect to um, especially in uh, chapter 23 and what that has to say about uh, what is it that officers or those leading men or those magistrates or those lesser magistrates, the civil magistrate in particular, uh, were to do? How were you to act? And this was something common, well known uh, within the context of the teaching of the church of the founders. Now, we're going to pick this up more particularly in the second segment. But what I want to leave you with is a, a couple of things that uh, Pastor Wilson had to say in his video on this primer uh, on Christian nationalism. And uh, one of the, the, the key essence of the program, the key essence uh, of the video uh, are here in that he uh, says this, and I want you to leave you with this to ponder as we move to the second segment here in the next bit. And not only, here he says it, and not only has this Christian nationalism thing been done before, it has been done in America before. If we succeed, this will not be Christian America. If we succeed, this will be Christian America 2.0. Well, Sam Adams was a member of 1.0. He was Christian America at the time. You all know him as the last Puritan from this program. Come on back in the next segment 
as we follow up and continue with Samuel Adams Returns. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Samuel Adams Returns. Those anti-federalists, they did get it right. And I'm going to jump right into it uh, at this moment in this second segment is that uh, the comparison in particular that I wanted to do here, which uh, Pastor Wilson does in his video on American nationalism, but I wanted to get to the full context. I'm not doing the comparison as much as many of you have heard me talk about and actually lecture on the uh, lesser magistrate. Now we look at the lesser magistrate from what happened in Magdeburg, and that was primarily with the Lutherans that were trying to be wiped out by the Holy Roman Emperor and all of Catholicism to destroy Lutheranism. Uh, A few weeks ago, I talked about the St. Bartholomew Massacre and what occurred there uh, with all that was going on in that whole French movement of Calvinistic Protestantism. And once again, the idea to destroy Protestant Christianity. Uh, In England, we had the same issues going on back and forth when uh, between Catholicism and Protestantism, and it became extremely violent, and it and it became that which uh, wars were fought over, people were murdered over, some were as they called martyred over. Uh, Sam Adams talks about this. It's brought out uh, even in the preface in that of what we're going to look at in the third segment, some of this segment, but in the third segment in relationship to um, the sermons of that American Revolution. The point of all of this is when we look at the Westminster Confession in particular, this was something that was well known and taught to pastors that was taught to the people. And every time I bring to you that the Republican Party does not raise up candidates, whereas we know in seeing the grooming of uh, uh, Patty Tennesseau, senator out of Washington, when we see the grooming of Obama by the communist Democrats to raise him up, when we see the grooming of all of these other younger uh, politicians. There's a guy here in Cleveland, Ohio. I don't live in Cleveland, but in Cleveland, Ohio, who's running for city council, and he says that you know, he'll support a mayor that will allow non-citizens to vote. You know, this is, this is raising up through the educational system and through the cultural environment, even inside the churches, inner city churches, and some of the, as I mentioned in the first segment, Uh, what I call the loosey-goosey churches, the, uh, I don't know, some people want to call them evangelical churches, but I don't think they are. They're the liberal churches. They're raising up leftists to take and go into government and move their agenda forward. Whereas at the foundational period, the whole intent of, on taking and raising up and maintaining magistrates was laid out very clearly here in the Westminster Confession or the American Revision, as it's called, in 1788 of the Westminster Standards. Now, you can hear the eloquence of Pastor Wilson if you go to the link in the um, newsletter at samueladamsreturns.net, and you'll find it right there for his video. But here's what the Westminster Confession says, and I'm going to read this whole section. He only quotes a portion of it, whereas I think it's important to read the whole section of it. And what I like is that the Westminster leaders, or they were called the divines of that day, 
they actually annotated everything with scripture. So this is not just, you know, some smoke that they grabbed out of the air and mishmashed into a bunch of words, nor did those that were at the convention there, the Presbyterian Convention in 1788, mishmash it. But this was the, the fundamental principle that is missing today in governance, in vetting candidates, in raising up candidates. This is why we're in the mess we're in, quite frankly. This is, this is a simple snapshot. It's, it's not the whole thing, but when it comes down to uh, what is missing in all the political rhetoric, political science, education, all of that um, hyperbola, I guess, all of the pundits, everybody that wants to get you emotionally riled up. But here's the sound principle. Here we go. This is the Westminster Confession, chapter 23.3. Civil magistrates may not assume uh, themselves the administration of the word and sacraments or the power of the keys of the kingdom of heaven or in the least interfere in matters of faith. Yet, as nursing fathers, it is the duty of civil magistrates to protect the church of our common Lord without giving the preference to any denomination of Christians above the rest in such a manner that all ecclesiastical persons whatever shall enjoy the full, free, and unquestioned liberty of discharging every part of their sacred functions without violence or danger. And as Jesus Christ had appointed a regular government and discipline in his church, no law of any commonwealth should interfere with let or hinder the due exercise thereof among the voluntary members of any denomination of Christians according to their own profession and belief. It is the duty of civil magistrates to protect the person and good name of all their people in such an effectual manner as that no person be suffered either upon pretense of religion or of infidelity, to offer any indignity, violence, abuse, or injury to any other person whatsoever, and to take order that all religious and ecclesiastical assemblies be held without molestation or disturbance. <clears throat> now, when we take and we look at the meaning of all of that, I, you're going to have to go study it for yourself. But we want to take and go further in here is in 23, or actually this is 31.1, for the better government and further edification of the church, there ought to be such assemblies as are commonly called synods or councils. Now, that's a specific to the church. But when we go back to the magistrate, it's critical that we look, and what I always talk about is that we, we don't teach the principles and the foundations necessary for someone to be able to f stand up truly, morally, uh, against what goes on in the political parties. The corruption in Ohio and in, in the Republican and Democrat parties, the corruption within all of the legislature, the lobbyists, the corruption of the lobbyist in the state, local government, and then obviously in the federal government, once again, was predicted by the Anti-Federalists. <clears throat> Over a week ago, I spoke at a Republican club and actually took people through uh, very, very quickly uh, Article One of the Ohio Constitution, which is our Bill of Rights. A sobering thought 
is that the majority in the room definitely knew that Ohio had a constitution. Uh, it, those that raised their hands, and again, there were some judges in there and some politicians who did not raise their hands, but of those that did raise their hands out of maybe close to 80 people, uh, four raised their hands saying that they ever read their constitution. The point of saying that is the continued lack of knowledge of what our rights truly are. And how are those rights to be protected by the political class or the bureaucratic class, bureaucratic class, if the fundamentals of those are not understood within the constitutions of a state or federal government? Well, the answer, obviously being rhetorical, is that it cannot be. And, and to have the ability then to be swayed by all of these external events, if someone does not have a spiritual grounding, which we're really going to get into in the third segment, which I say is the mirrors of history, in that what Pastor Wilson is saying in his uh, discussion on Christian nationalism is actually in the foreword and introduction in what I was telling you in the book on the sermons of the revolution. In that, then I think we'll jump to it now. Uh, so I'm going to go over to that. Uh, in what is there in that introduction uh, in reference to what we just said, I, I want to take you to, oh, on here, it, this would be page 19 and 20 within the introduction, um, and it talks about what is going on in, in the system, in the political system, what was happening in New England in particular, and uh, what happened as a result of understanding the foundational truths and those in a biblical manner is that it was uh, I'm going to read from it for you and I'm going to read heavily in the third segment because I think it's very important is that um, the churches uh, actually became petty democracies electing their officers and ministers making their own laws and regulating their own affairs so far as possible by the system of polity indicated with more or less distinction in holy scripture and this is how the communities were formed not just the church community but the communities in the 1600s as they came together out of this condition of things the state was gradually developed. So the state or the colony of that time was developed because of this fundamental understanding. This is Christianity or Christian nationalism, Christian America 1.0. Here was individualism, an admirable system for making good, full-blooded Puritan citizens, but very poor and unmanageable subjects. So this is where George III, and as it went, um, had difficulties beginning there in 1763. So what we had was the clergy could retain no authority, but they had great influence. They had great power in the people's heart, says Winthrop. Religion predominated over all other interests. We don't have that anymore. What we have is economy is predominant over everything, including liberty. I've talked to you a number of times of liberty takes the back seat to economy. Well, even that over liberty, you can't understand liberty without Christianity. You can't do it. It's impossible. So as they were looking at religion, they were looking at the foundational Christian, biblical, reformed, reformation religion. And as near the law of God as they can be, with instructions of the general court to their committee of laity and ministry appointed to frame the laws of the commonwealth. That's what happened. 
Sam Adams knew it, and that's what he stood on. That's what they all did, especially in New England, is they stood on the foundations of the Christian religion for civil religion. Come on back. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this last segment of Samuel Adams Returns. This is uh, Tom Novolis, your host. You can find all of the archives of the program at samueladamsreturns.net, as well as you can find uh, the newsletter for this program there also. Uh, For those in the other markets that do not get the second segment, I highly recommend that you go listen to the last segment because I delve into a lot of things that obviously you miss in that last 15 minutes. What I do want to bring you back to is that of the pulpits of the revolution. And in fact, I think it's incumbent upon you to go and listen to Pastor Wilson's uh, message there on the uh, Christian Nationalism 2.0. Christian Nationalism originated, as we talked about, under the basis of clear understanding of the Westminster Confession, clear understanding that religion was predominant over economy, religion was predominant over liberty, religion was predominant. In fact, it is uh, here in the introduction that uh, I'm going to quote something. It says, the name of Hugh Peter reminds us that New England shared in the English Revolution of 1640. Did you know that? They sent preachers and soldiers aid and comfort to Cromwell. They sent things to Cromwell from New England. Uh, Gave an asylum to the Tyrannicides, Whaley, Goff, and Dixwell reaffirm the same maxims of liberty in the revolution of 1688. This was New England reaffirming the, the same maxims and so stood right on the record for the third revolution in 1776. The foundational maxims that were stood upon for America were those of foundational reformation biblical Christian principles. So I guess I go with what Pastor Wilson said, and I'm going to uh, read that again for those that missed it in the second segment, because I think it's a, a good starting place, is he says this, he goes on to say in uh, that video, quote, and not only has this Christian nationalism thing been done before, It has been done in America before. If we succeed, this will not be Christian America. If we succeed, this will be Christian America 2.0. So I'm taking you in that reflections of what he is saying and the reflections of history, the mirrors of history in that Christian America had these foundational principles. From the preface of the book uh, on the sermons of the revolution, it says this, the true alliance between political and religion is the lesson inculcated in this volume of sermons and apparent in its title, The Pulpits of the Revolution. It is the voice of the fathers of the republic enforced by their example They invoked God in their civil assemblies, called upon their chosen teachers of religion for counsel from the Bible, and recognized its precepts as the law of their public conduct. The fathers did not divorce politics and religion, but they denounced the separation as ungodly not true in the majority of the churches today. They still blabber separation of church and state. Well, I'm sorry. It's a lie. And if your pastor thinks that, he is deceived. If your deacons, your elders, your church leaders believe that, they are deceived. You need to understand 
truth. The union of the colonies was a condition precedent to American nationality. Whoa, American nationalism. Here's what it is. One nationality and that of Protestant people was essential to constitutional liberty in America. If the colonies had become separate independencies at different times, America would have but repeated the history of European divisions and wars. I have long said, and I'm going to go off just for a couple moments here. Hey, it's my program. I can do that. I'm going off the topic for a moment. And this is is not racist, prejudicial, or anything. This is observable fact. Our founders, with the educational system, intended, even through Ellis Island and the great influx we had in immigration, was to take and ensure that every person became an American first understand our principles to take that oath of allegiance to America. Here was, it is stated very, very clearly that foundationally we are to be of one nationality. And here the preference of the founders was that of a Protestant people because they're in, in that, we understand what it means in the teaching of liberty of Christ. We understand the Westminster Confession saying how lesser magistrates, magistrates in general, should act. We understand that it is the purposes of God and Scripture that define law. But when we start bringing in all of these folks that then have no allegiance to America, and I have to tell you, go look at all the different nationalities in high tech, and you can see that they have no sense of Americanism whatsoever. You think they care? No. I worked in high tech. I saw it with my own eyes ears and interactions with some of the top people in the early foundations of high technology. And I can tell you very clearly, they give a rip about American values. So coming back to once again, this whole idea of what is it with uh, these sermons. Let me take a moment just to reflect again where I was on this paragraph in saying that Hutchinson, who was a governor, he was a lieutenant governor and then governor of the colonies, says that Reverend John Cotton was supposed to have been more instrumental in the settlement of, the, of their civil as well as ecclesiastical polity than any other man. He, too, the representative man of New England, was, as could not be otherwise expected, remembering his life, a sound commonwealth man. To him, that being Hutchinson, pastor of the Church of Boston in New England, here's what Com actually Cromwell was writing to uh, none other than uh, Reverend John Cotton, he said in his letter, I received yours a few days since, and this was back in 1651. It was welcome to me because signed by you, whom I love and honor in the Lord, but more to see some of the same grounds of our acting stirring in you that are in us to quiet us in our work and support us herein. Here we cannot but stop for a moment by way to notice a beautiful and significant incident. In a recent date, which must excite, delight, if not exultation, it is this. The very Episcopal authorities which silenced the voice of Cotton within the venerable walls of Boston Church in Lincolnshire in England 
and banished him and his Puritan brethren, after the lapse of two centuries, invited us, the descendants of those exiles, to join with them in the brotherly union to remind distinguished honors to the memory. The Founders Chapel of Noble Church, beautifully renovated and reopened as Cotton Chapel. And in the eastern arch was set a large, highly ornamental memorial tablet of brass bearing an inscription in Latin from the classical pen of Mr. Everett. In English it reads, In perpetual remembrance of John Cotton, who during the reigns of James and Charles was for many years a grave, skillful, learned, and laborious vicar of this church. Afterwards, on account of the miserable commotion amongst sacred affairs in his own country, he sought a new settlement in a new world and remained even to the end of his life, a pastor and a teacher of the greatest reputation and of the greatest authority in the First Church of Boston in New England, which received this venerable name in honor of Cotton. This goes on just as that remembrance of John Cotton. But I want to bring back to you some of the key ideas uh, that are in the introduction about these sermons. So it talks in here is that this collection of sermons presents examples of the politico-theological phrase or phase of the conflict for American independence, a phase not peculiar to that period. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're in that phase again. Whether you realize it or not, it's, it's not about MAGA, it's not about leftist, it's not about centrist. What it's about is the political theological battle that's going on. We see that the evil in the bureaucracies and the political class are attacking the very fundamental foundations of every Christian biblical principle out there. <clears throat> that was going on during the foundation of this nation. So there is a natural and just union of religious and civil councils, not that external alliance of the corsair or and the sword called church and state, but the philosophical and union which recognizes God as supreme ruler. Right there, that is not taught the way that it needs to be taught in our churches. It's not understood in the universities. It's not understood by the political class. As you well know, and I'm going to have to leave it here, we're down to our last little bit of a minute, is that what it comes down to understanding that our founders understood was the sovereignty of God in all things. We don't allow for that any longer. We don't recognize it. We don't teach it, except in those very few churches that do. <clears throat> the political class, the different organizations out there are not going to be the ones that restore liberty in America. They're not going to restore the fundamentals of constitutionalism. It's going to be the pulpits. It's going to be the pulpits and the people that understand the sovereignty of God. It's going to be raising up political leaders, educators, and thinkers that understand the sovereignty of God and will not be swayed away from it. Sam Adams was such a person. That's why one of his monikers is the last Puritan. I was going to go through a number of his writings, but we don't have time to do that. 
But I will say that in the foundations of everything, and you can go and look at uh, the reference there, SamuelAdamsReturns.net, and know that Sam, writing as a Puritan, brings this to a head, that the battle is that of Christianity. Come on back next week when Samuel Adams does return and the Anti-Federalists got it right. Right.